warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to you know, the organizing committee uh, for inviting me, especially to Dr. Ambar. Uh, I feel so excited, but also sad that I have to deliver this talk you know, far away from Yogyakarta. I was looking forward to coming to the city because Yogyakarta is one of my favorite cities in Java. Uh, but then, yes, the situations that everyone is facing uh, does not allow us to get, you know, in touch, you know, physically uh, and to share, you know, uh, our knowledge and experiences in doing research uh, within the same room or maybe same building. Anyway, uh, so when Dr. Ambar asked me to give a talk about uh, society 5.0. I was going to give a talk about, you know, the historical trajectory of industry 4.0 and how it develops into society 5.0. Uh, but then, um, you know, I changed my mind because, you know, for the past three months, we uh, have seen something that caused the regular trajectory of stages of development from industry five, you know, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and nice society, they're all crumbling, okay? And the border, the boundary between, you know, developed economies and developing economies or even undeveloped economies are now irrelevant because we see how you know, developed societies, advanced economies are suffering uh, much worse uh, in terms of, you know, the COVID-19 impact compared to some countries that are relatively less developed. And so this, this, is, this is a crisis, the kind of crisis that, of course, you know, I made some attention, not only in terms of how we think about, you know, what's gonna happen you know, after the crisis, but what we really need to do in responding to the crisis. And I refrain, I refrain myself from using the term new normal, especially when talking about Indonesia, because a new normal is not yet to embrace in Indonesia as the crisis is still ongoing and the number of cases are hiking up. And this is something that we need to pay attention. And it is, it is in my way of giving attention that I, that I would like to change my, you know, my, my talk from Society 5.0 to what I've been working for the past three months in responding to the crisis. So allow me to share my slides. Okay, I hope everyone can see my slide here. So uh, this is a project that I've been working for the past three months. And I think it's more relevant to share this project than talking about, you know, society 5.0 at the moment. It's not that, you know, it's a disrespect to the conference theme, but I think it is something, it is a topic that is more relevant to discuss as we are you know, enduring from uh, the, you know, pandemic crisis. So uh, when we talk about pandemic, uh, it can be seen from two perspectives. One is that pandemic or epidemic or endemic or outbreak or whatever you call it, you know, uh, uh, depends on, on, depending on the scale of the crisis, uh, it can be seen from two perspectives. One is that pandemic is a, fen is, is a natural phenomenon uh, or more specifically it's biological phenomenon because it revolves around the existence of a, of a virus that cause harms to our body, to human body. And, in res and, 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 and because this is a natural phenomenon, we need a medical intervention to respond to it. Uh, uh, such as, you know, the use of vaccines, uh, the conduct uh, of testing and treatment and etc. But on the other hand, you know, 
virus outbreak or pandemic can also be seen as a social phenomenon. Why? Because the spread and transmission of this virus is facilitated, is, is largely facilitated by social interaction. So the patterns of transmission is very much aligned with the patterns of social behavior. And this is, uh, this is evidence in many cases, in many countries that are affected by you know, COVID-19. And in response to that, we need social interventions in terms of you know, isolating those who are infected and also controlling the interactions in the crowd, in, in public places, and et cetera. And at the moment, at the time when the vaccine is not yet you know, uh, invented, uh, social interventions are you know, more crucial to, 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 to develop because it is the only way for us to contain the virus spread. So when we talk about in flattening the curve, basically what we see here is that the effort, all of the efforts that we try to, you know, to flatten the curve comes from social intervention. And this show that social interventions are extremely crucial in our response to the crisis. Now, when we talk about social interventions, there are two conventional strategies that are that have been employed by you know, different countries. Uh, and these two conventional strategies uh, can be considered as two opposite you know, uh, 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 approaches. One is total lockdown and the other one is social distancing. I'm going to address the weaknesses and the advantages of these two approaches. Uh, respectively. So when we talk about total lockdown, it is a very effective you know, approach because it used you know, enforcement to suppress you know, the virus spread. And this, this is proof in countries like in China and also in, in, in some European countries like in, in Italy uh, and in some cities in the United States and etc. But the, uh, the downside of total lockdown is that it is extremely you know, uh, uh, costly because it requires you know, uh, government support to help those who cannot you know, go to work and have to rely on uh, a government uh, uh, assistance. There's also some impact in terms of political risk when we, when we uh, uh, see some countries, when we look at some countries, there are socially you know, unstable, like what happens in Ecuador and also in Brazil and some uh, yeah, small European countries. Uh, and there's also some facts that uh, 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 a total lockdown that has been that there was that is carried out for uh, quite you know long periods of time will have will cause you know, social depressions among the people. And this is what happens in Wuhan, you know, after the lockdown was, was open, you know, people do not trust each other and they still feel uh, you know, the depressions under the lockdown. But the greatest impact is the disruption on economy. And this is the reason why you know, uh, President Jokowi did not go with this approach when uh, responding to the uh, outbreak, uh, to the COVID-19 outbreak in Jakarta uh, two months ago. On the other hand, we have this social distancing, which is the approach that the current government is taking and uh, promoting to everyone to do. Uh, it is more affordable because it, it uh, it doesn't require a big amount of government subsidies and it's relatively easy to implement. But the downside it is, it is, is that it is less effective because it depends on social compliance. And the social compliance is influenced or uh, also depend, depends on the level of social trust and economic constraints of the society. And this is what we see in a, a, a uh, unfolding in many cities uh, across Java Islands and also in Sumatra and especially in my hometown Makassar, you know, social distancing is not working because the lack of social trust of the people to the government in addition 
uh, uh, let alone, I uh, know, not to mention the economic constraints that they have to suffer during the social distancing period. So the challenge here is how to organize a more effective suppressions on the, uh, the, uh, on the fire spread, but with less disruption and impact on social and economic activities. And this is what I've been develop developing in my uh, uh, social resilience lab at NTU here with my uh, very small team. Uh, and it is approach that we call as micro lockdown, which is very much a middle, uh, uh, a middle ground approach between, you know, total lockdown lockdown and social distancing. So I'm going to spend another 10 minutes to, to elaborate uh, you know, the concept and the impact or the, the benefits of micro lockdown. So micro lockdown is, uh, is, is a strategy that is based on community and we are very much informed and also inspired by a document that World Health Organization uh, um, released in 2018, in which it is said that communities, when engaged, are the front line in detecting and managing epidemics. They are most affected, they are most affected and have the greatest influence in anticipation and preparedness as new diseases emerge or old ones re-emerge. So this document is not you know, specifically about COVID-19, but you know, pandemic or epidemic in general, but we see the relevance of this, you know, uh, a statement uh, or a suggestions to the uh, uh, social and economic conditions in Indonesian society. So the micro lockdown approach or the micro lockdown strategy has uh, this particular uh, basic features. One is that it is basically a concurrence of lockdowns carried out at a small scale. So it is a series of uh, concurrent lockdowns uh, implemented at a small scale. And it has a modular structure in which a small social unit will be responsible to carry out or implement this lockdown within their own area. And it is very much self-organizing and it runs on community engagement rather than you know, government uh, 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 um, uh, apparatuses and uh, and uh, our model and simulation shows that it is particularly effective in urban areas with dense population and we see this in urban areas with dense population across Java such as Jakarta, Bandung, Yogyakarta, you know, uh, uh, Surabaya and etc. So Visually, uh, this is the difference between micro lockdown and total lockdown. On the left, you see a total lockdown model, which is basically a big giant square where everyone is inside and cannot leave their homes. While micro lockdown uh, consists of smaller you know, squares and everyone stays within their own squares. They still can move outside their, uh, 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 they, they still can go out uh, uh, from their homes, but then they have to remain within their own square. So this is how we you know, imagine you know, the implementations of micro lockdown. Um, excuse now, me, excuse me, yes, you have five yes. more minutes. Thank you. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, so how to calculate the efficacy of micro lockdown? So we have some mathematical models to uh, calculate this, you know, uh, the, the effectiveness of micro lockdown. I'm not going to explain this. Let me just skip it. But uh, uh, the bottom line here is that when you have uh, same number of infections and then you uh, divide people into different uh, uh, um, squares, you're going to end up with lower amount of infection risk. So we see here on the left side, the infection risk is greater than infection risk on the right side. Uh, and this is the model that we, uh, the simulation that we developed. Uh, this is some uh, simulations that we conducted to show uh, the, uh, the impact of social, uh, the, the impact of micro lockdown in comparison with social distancing, let me just, um, okay, and then this is the, uh, the, the micro lockdown here, okay, you see, uh, so if you see this graph, you, uh, this is the micro lockdown, okay, uh, this is no interventions, it's, this is social distancing, this is the micro lockdown. 
Okay, so uh, theoretically uh, or computationally, uh, when we talk about you know, uh, industry 4.0 or 5.0, uh, uh, a micro lockdown strategy is more effective uh, in terms of that, then social distancing in terms of you know uh, suppressing the number of infection cases. Of course, it's less effective than total lockdown, but it's much cheaper, which I'm going to explain. So micro lockdown is suitable to be implemented in in cities like such as Makassar, Jakarta, Bandung, etc. And this is the model the modular structure in which you have a close area at the level of let's say Kelurahan or maybe lower than that, and you have Kelurahan at the center, uh, a sharing center for food, medicine, and information. And, uh, and the gate is it's, it's guarded by you know by the Kelurahan you know and and there are three basic conditions uh, uh, for those uh, who live within in one close area first is that they need to stay within their Kelurahan or this close area they still can go out of their homes but keep physical distancing and wear masks uh, but uh, the, the benefit is that small economic activities are still allowed to operate, like, you know, the wiring are still open, convenience store, laundry, small business, etc. And there is a, a to facilitate, you know, a transfer of goods between Kelurahan, we use this, you know, Ojol, which is, well, let's say a part of uh, uh, industry 4.0. Uh, and there, there should be a sort of, uh, a double enforcement, both physical and digital, to make sure that everyone stay within their uh, their own area, and this is uh, uh, what we also suggest to uh, you know to facilitate a digital based grocery shopping. So this is not an e-commerce. E-commerce is different because uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's done by in you know, a big giant in companies, but this is something that can be done uh, by uh, uh, local. Uh, 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 markets, local traditional markets. Uh, and this is the timeline. So uh, the benefit of uh, micro lockdown is that you need to lock down uh, the, uh, uh, the city uh, to have a micro lockdown city for seven consecutive days. But then after that, you have a one day of respite. So one day of a break. So the gate is open, and after and after that you go back to lockdown. So one round consists of seven days of lockdown and one day of respite. So to suppress the the, the infection cases to the minimum, maybe we can have uh, uh, two or three rounds or four rounds depending on the scale and the problem. So the conclusion is that um, uh, of uh, uh, to I know uh, the conclusion of my talk is that first. Uh, social interventions are extremely crucial, as I already said, in responding to COVID-19, especially when the vaccine is not yet available. And But then social intervention varies across societies, depending on social, economic, and political circumstances. And in the context of Indonesian society, we need to find a suitable strategies that will be implementable, doable, with more affordable you know, costs. And uh, I, we suggest that micro-lockdown is, is an alternative strategy to mitigate uh, because we address you know social and economic constraints while being able to contain the virus and actually uh, I'm happy to tell you that the model of micro lockdown has been implemented uh, in some cities uh, in, especially in Jakarta and West Java although they have to modify the model to suit their conditions so in West Java they implement the micro lockdown at at uh, small, uh, smaller villages and areas, while in Jakarta, and they have a micro lockdown at the uh, level of airway and air. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh